Hello, my name is, um, <laughs> see if I can remember it. Uh, it is Jay Ponteri. I'm the director of the Low Residency Creative Writing Program. And we are here, <laughs> um, kind of a two part evening. First, we will have our final reading of thesis candidate students. Um, then we will take a short break. And by that time, you will start to see some snacks rolling in. There might be some music. The, there's going to be some wonderful things happening during the break. Um, just to let the students know, the graduating students, please, during that break, don't go too far because we, um, the, the Office of Student Life will be kind of running through the the graduation run of show. Um, so, and then the second part of the evening will be our graduation ceremony. So I hand it over to our student host, low residency creative writer, Rachel Keller, will be doing introductions this evening. <laughs> All right. Uh, first up, we have Cheryl David. Um, where, am I talking to this? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, all right. Cheryl David's thesis on Thursday, we present boxes, examines intracultural trauma using collective narrators in a nonlinear format, a culmination of ideas resulting from a bachelor's degree in English literature and new media from Mer Merrill Hurst University and a master's in fine arts in creative writing from Willamette University's Pacific Northwest College of Art. After reading The Colonel by Carolyn Forge, Cheryl cannot look at a peach without thinking of the current state of her ears. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Cheryl. All right, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you can hear me since I did all the audio testing. So let's get this party started. I'm gonna be reading from my thesis on Thursdays. We present boxes. We never knew why associate pastor Ripton E. Clark decided to build that garden. No one in the neighborhood next to the church was in need of food. And the congregation, as far as we knew, were middle class and didn't want for the basics of life. There was all that land back behind the church and the church owned it. And for years, it just laid there vacant. But associate pastor Clark wanted a garden for the church. So we built one around the one grizzly oak tree in the middle of the field. That garden was big. He didn't use all of the brown field, but he marked off a good portion of it, put a cute white picket fence around it with an unlocked gate and planted flowers and fruits and vegetables and built raised bed for lettuces. Volunteers came out with their lawn tractors to do the big work like turning over that hard soil and moving big rocks. Moving the soil unearthed large boulders, big enough to squish a person. Those were lined up in the very back of the field, demarking a property line that didn't exist to the naked eye. In the summertime, dahlias bloomed colorfully up against the white picket fence that framed the garden. Immune to the scorching summer heat with no real shade, the flowers bloomed spectacularly, a shock of pinks and yellows and reds against the brown of the dead crab grass. Associate Pastor Clark set up a sprinkler system on a timer within the white gate of the garden. At 4 a.m., those of us who lived in the row of houses across the street from that big field could hear the snickering start of the sprinklers beginning their cycle. The youth of the community, whether part of the church or not, and youthful offenders worked in the garden at peak growing seasons. Associate pastor had t-shirts made as well as water bottles to give to those who gave their time with the church logo and Cully Street Church Garden in a decorative font emboldened with the outlines of flowers. 
Yardley Manor, who started volunteering at the garden as community service after the bullying charge, spent a lot of time in the garden and eventually became Ripton's assistant in keeping the volunteers flowing. Yardley was found two summers ago in the garden, hanging from the big tree. Max Berman, out for his early morning walk with his Jack Russell, Virgil King, found Yardley and poor Max hasn't been right since. Not that he was right to begin with. He was an extremely neat man who favored old school manicures, carried clear nail polish and a nail file in his shirt pocket, ironed his jeans and his socks and washed and waxed his car on the weekend. He wasn't creepy, just a bit odd. He was the one who called the police that early spring morning, the time of morning when the colors of the sky matched the bruises around Yardley's neck from the rope. The police made sure Yardley was removed before more folks woke up and started their day, which we thought was a good thing since the garden was in the line of sight when cars leave the neighborhood. No one knew why, out of all the places to take her own life, she decided to use that garden, the green oasis and that field of dried out brown. Aswilla said the expanse of brown dead grass represented the souls of some of those who had passed by without turning their heads. We asked her, did they have their eyes towards heaven? Is that why they wouldn't turn their heads? Were Yardley's eyes towards heaven when she died? We asked Aswilla because that tree where she hung herself was in perfect view right outside of her living room window. Thank you. Thanks so much, Cheryl. Up next we have Riley. Riley is a woman writer, a writer with mental illness, a poet, an essayist, and an author. Most of her work revolves around how different traumas impact how she exists in her body, in the world, and in relation to other bodies. She writes about pregnancy loss and infertility and womanhood and motherhood, and how these things help her understand the impacts of trauma. Riley's poetry and prose have been published in over 30 literary journals, both online and in print. She has an AS in English uh, from Clackamas Community College and a BA in English Literature and Writing from Merrill Hirsch University. She lives in Portland, Oregon. Everyone, please welcome Riley. Just gonna do a quick sound switch. Yeah, the, uh, it's because it's not on. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's good. Some of them have switches and some of them don't. There we go. And the recording's falling apart, but I do have to make sure it's just like that. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm let's short, I'm it. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Short people problems. Okay, um, so I'm going to be reading from my thesis, Cartography of Grief. First period after my second miscarriage. Ear pressed to the door in the floor of the bathroom, back spasms snaking under skin to the hollowed and left vacant. Cramps of burnt out electric sockets, echoes of contractions stealing away my unborn. Body is regret, and now I am reminded of scarlet smoke. No fetus in my womb now, just claws of charcoal. Can't taste anything now, just carbon crying tears of phosphorus in my bloodied and laid to waste body, my raised to the ground and made ruin of body. How much death can breathe through my pores before I too am a cloud voided of rain? Mitosis. Can I inhabit the place of your destruction? Inhale your fibers, hold the breath forever. I cannot write you into a history without the blood river and the vaginal speculum of cracked glass cannot write a version of this tale that doesn't end with the howling of my shadow giving up your fluttering package of tissue. Sometimes language is a burnt out light bulb scrapping the under, scraping the underside of skin. 
If I can find the right words and deposit them into my womb, would enough of you still roam this landscape to bear fruit? If I can make my way into the caverns you left behind, will I find your roots? And if I water them, bury them deep in the soil of my muslin hopes, will I finally taste the words you never got to speak? Sweet and sour. I remember blood dripping down my legs, hot, sticky ribbons of mahogany smoke. I remember pressure piercing into hip bones. I remember lightning bolts and extensors, flexors, obliques. I remember needing to urinate. I remember only producing petals of crimson river it hurt to lose, petals that hurt worse to hold in. I remember the painkillers. I remember they did not kill my pain. I remember laughing as if I wasn't a destroyer, as if this pile of flesh had not uncreated what it was meant to create. I remember I ate sweet and sour chicken. I remember the sauce sticky and warm and red like the river of smoke between my thighs. I remember I was sick, purging chicken, purging sticky sauce that looked like my purging womb. I remember I never ate sweet and sour chicken again. I remember writhing on the floor. I remember claws inside me leaving marks. I remember screams. I remember pillars of shame. I remember death in my body like a fanned flame and on my breath, a sulfur I had not conjured. I gotta find my next page. Corporal, have you ever rued the day you ever dared to dare? Stared into future's face and inhaled. Smelled honeysuckle skin of newborn flesh and danced on clouds of baby powder. Have you ever wished for the death of hope? Becoming a haven. My body like a groan can't be less than it isn't. A tree or tail or body of scales. The creek, furled wings unfurling howls. My body like a tree can't move without groaning. Groans without knowing why. Sways under gravity of unflapped wings. Bends and arches under starstruck tempests. I don't like how my body moves. My body moves like groans have grown roots and roots have grown wings. Hot angst in bones, the wind roams among scales and leaves arcing under beastling tracks and forest fire. Dissected. If I cut open my abdomen, would I see your shadow? Or would I find a clear hollow shape etched in silica glass floating in a burgundy tide? Are there fibers of tissue embedded into my sandcastle walls or have I formed around your absence? Does my uterus remember your turbulence? Is the shape of you in my blood a mutation of hauntedness? Or is it memory shape-shifting under the pull of a distant orbit? Maybe this is how broken hearts reach for what can never be reclaimed. We just have one more. I cannot carry these fists. I can only think of sticky Merlot clots flooding, a wave slithering over my sails. I wanted to punch someone but who was there to blame with my balled up fists? This is a memory I cannot stop reliving. It makes me unhinge my jaw and cry out to the moon that stole from me. It's a beautiful breakdown, a toppling, a shedding of bones and flesh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Riley. Up next, we have Joanna. 
Joanna Kaufman grew up in living in four regions of the US. She received her undergraduate degree in Spanish and education from Northern Arizona University and worked as a Spanish language teacher for 10 years in the US and in Japan. Joanna currently lives in Trout Lake, Washington, where she works as a painter, writer, and illustrator, and is an MFA candidate in cross-genre studies in the Low Residency Creative Writing Program at PNCA of Willamette. Her thesis is a cross-genre book titled The Windows of Altamira. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Joanna. Thank you so much. <clears throat> This piece is for, I have a few pieces here that are written, uh, dedicated to um, various poets. This is for Joanna Geiger. Hemisphere. Is part of whole, whole of whole, part of part, wobbly stack of vertiginous paper mache, gathering things to things in mixed flowers, water slathers, gooey, packs oozy, fields undulate, gushing, heat springs, handy lengths of beards holding tanks and transmission lines for farmers, testing skies, no rain on combine back or silo, semi-mill refineries, traffic rubber. While water faucets fade in front-facing headlines, clip and inks run under duress. Wheat water says something part language, part touching. Letters, so-and-so, part such, and such the double, inside, outside, strips connection, page four on back, side three and eight in two, paper makes part, words put minds together. Trellis for Federico Garcia Lorca. Arched with the morning sun, there are flowers. Even the winter takes inside her frozen dress the flowers. East flowers, rise with the sunflowers, gaze of petals and one bud, one stem, the dahlia, camellia, the rose I love. And do not pick them apart to stammer in with a knife and clumsy feet, looking for one to take I want not. To possess gardenia faces down, so walk round, stone slippered among today, one bent my knee, gathered my nose in soft, velvet, darkness, folded petaled flutes. Of course I knelt in rapture of the orange burial lamp tips and the day not given to change in leaving blossoms to fall alone. Snow is soft and does not trouble the root. Here as winter nears, bring the cut of your hand in close for I would grow cold without. From the window pane, I see the stars are in me now to embolden, to embody. Somehow we do inhabit the stars. How do they see us from their place of here with the telescope of their nebulous eyes? Where are the stars going? They must see from the beginning before eyes existed. How can anything see without the iris? The torpor look of the mind of love sees for the first time in stillness and remembers everything to see more from the intention of sight, just as feeling comes to meet the present, it reveals itself. Does a river need to see where it is going to see it to it that it goes? What agency I have given the river? Why not when my life comes from it? I am the river on my way to the sea. The beloved earth holds an unquenchable fullness that cannot be satiated. Step inside and be filled. The sight of life wanting to live rips through my soul. Vines are hanging from my teeth, ripping out my teeth, binding my tongue, sucking tepid salivas, taking my life, my flowers and time, telling them out on the petaled ground, bees giving them, dripping the sun over hot pollen cakes and cradles. There are wombs of stars in garden sheds, shed pesticides, shed ants, bellies full of beetles, where are they in the priority, in the line of to-do list hell? Don't take it out on us, they say. Take your gloves and your death clouds to the disappearance of the universe. We never want to see you here again. Take not but your own realization, says the rose. Bow roses full and blooming, bloodied by the sheer imagination of thorns. Push roses in the wound, eat me, life. Faith not anything, real is all realism, reality. Real life, really. We don't fake that. It's not in our nature to do. And this last poem is by is for Antonio Machado. 
and it was written on March 24th, 2020. I imagine you beleaguered, I am, with tears. Is this the land you inhabit? I let my tears grow, will you not? I will not hold the misshapen word outside, even as the lantern sounds, as bees on pages amplify their wings. Their likeness is summation. Pollens fall in audible pins into my bowl. They do not have the consummation of flowers over divided petals in flight. Wax catacombs on the cathedral steps land where no one is allowed to see them. None attend the preparations of wakeful hours. Do not go with me. The sun carries far the sun. Come again once to say forgetting what comes after. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. Up next, we have Sarah Batt. Sarah Batt is a queer disabled poet and artist living on the Oregon coast. They have two self-published books, multiple chat books and art books, and were published in UDSA's literary magazine, Kaleidoscope. After completing their BFA in creative writing at PNCA, they went on to pursue their MFA at PNCA as well, culminating in their thesis project, a memoir entitled Intimacy Atlas. Everyone, please welcome Sarah Batt. Hi. Hi. Um, so I will be reading you guys two pieces from my thesis, Intimacy Atlas, today. Um, the first piece is titled Fourth of July, Dad. No, I did not choose these pieces because tomorrow is 4th of July. That's just a strange coincidence. Um, 4th of July, dad. I would have been just a few months newly 15, which means my father and I were still coming down from the nose piercing fight. One of the fights I would not tell my mother about until much later. I got my nose pierced on my 15th birthday and my father claimed we ambushed him with it. I'd been talking about it for months. Later, when I was alone in my room and he was drunk, he hissed at me about it, taunting me, asking me, what's next, your clit? He was sober, or at least he wasn't drunk, but we still walked to the baseball diamond. He must not have gotten his license back fully yet. He'd had it suspended the summer before, after a DUI and a night spent in jail, and then again when he hit someone on the way to work and then took off. When he got in the hit footnote, when he got in the hit and run, the person who came to find him, what, or came looking for him was my elementary school's DARE officer. Uh, and my mother thinks that the reason he ran from the scene was because he had a joint in the ashtray. It was the 4th of July, which makes it one of the only fights with my father I can put a date to. That's why we walked to the baseball diamond. That's where American Canyon used to always hold their 4th of July festivities. I don't remember if we watched the parade that morning, but I remember walking down to the baseball diamond and it was before they put in the crosswalks across Highway 29 and the grass was brown and dry and the air was brown and dry. And I was wondering if Italian soda and a really big baked potato were really worth the heat and additional exposure to my father. I don't remember what we did on the baseball field. I don't remember how long we stayed, if I played any games, if my father wandered off somewhere and I had to go find him. Footnote, my father did this frequently. It's part of the reason we stopped traveling with him. He was usually either looking for somewhere to get stoned or looking for mushrooms. What I do remember is the afternoon after we got back. I remember sitting at my laptop in my bedroom at the desk on the underside of my loft bed. The door into the backyard is open so Thunder, our lovable mutt of a dog, can move in and out as she pleases. I don't remember what I was doing. In all likelihood, it was writing and or reading fan fiction, probably Harry Potter, probably HHR. Footnote, HHR is the internet slang shortening of the ship name for Harry Potter and Hermione Granger. Mm -hmm. 
My father came in to talk to me. I don't remember if he came in from the living room or the backyard, but he came up to my desk and started talking. I was only sort of listening, being a teenager and also with my father being a raging asshole. He must have known I was upset with him. It was kind of my default state at the time. Then he said the one thing I remember about this day with perfect fucking clarity. I know I'm a jerk to you when I'm drunk, he says. Understatement of the fucking year, I think to myself. That's why I'm going to stop, he says. Yeah, fucking right, I think to myself, my heart already nursing that tiny flame of hope. Here's the thing you need to know to understand what happened between my father and I. When I was a young kid, we were very, very close. He let me play doctor with him and put barrettes in his hair and draw all over him with markers. He drew giant green dots on all of my softballs so I could focus on them better during t-ball games. There was a time in his life, in all of our lives, where my father was a great dad. There was a time I loved my dad. And now, looking back, I see the 4th of July of 2008 as the day I gave up on my father. I guess that's not technically accurate. It was about two weeks later I truly gave up, but I don't remember the exact date, and it's what he said on July 4th that set his final fuck up in motion. Some days later, my mom and I were watching Charlie Bartlett, a movie which, ironically and unbeknownst to us, turned out to prominently feature an alcoholic father. My father, already wasted in the middle of the afternoon, threw an absolute fit about this. I don't remember what he did. I just remember feeling like a table in a dining room where someone had tried to pull the tablecloth from under all of the plates, but they screwed up and everything on the table fell and shattered on the floor, staining the carpets and the dinner linens with red wine. And that day, watching Robert Downey Jr. drunkenly fuck up his relationship with his daughter, Kat Dennings, as my father drunkenly fucked up his relationship with my mother and I even further, I realized that my father had made a choice. He told me on July 4th to my face that he knew the way he treated me was wrong and he was going to stop and he was going to stop drinking. And here he was, not even two weeks later, hiding vodka in the dog food bag and yelling at my mother and I for daring to watch a movie in the living room. It was the day I stopped believing he would ever get any better. And don't misconstrue my words. I know my father had an addiction, a disease. I hold no ill will towards addicts, but time and time again, help was offered to my father that he did not take. AA, NA, anger management, therapy, rehab. Sick or not, you can't help someone who doesn't want it. Um, and then the next piece is called Fourth of July, Mom. So it's 2010 and the day after Pride and I'm having knee surgery. This injury is just another in a long line of questions we won't have an answer for until nearly a decade later. For now, it's just an unfortunate coincidence. Then suddenly it's 4th of July and I've been on our tiny, un uh, I've been in our tiny uninsulated house, laying in bed for eight straight days, taking Vicodin, sleeping and eating salads from Wendy's. I am also a truly terrible sick person. It's only been eight days and recovery has already been a bit of a trial on my mom and I. After all, she's a single mother and was in her 50s at the time and I'm four inches taller than her, heavier and had a hip to ankle brace that completely prevented me from bending my left leg. So obviously I decide I want to get out of the house and go watch the fireworks. This is by all accounts, a terrible idea. I have had major surgery. There are steps at our front door. My mom drives a Toyota Corolla and we already know that getting me in and out of that car is a nightmare. We could barely get me out of it when I came home from surgery, which was another kind of a disaster entirely. Footnote, I should have stayed overnight in the hospital, but I am as stubborn as my mother is accommodating and indulgent of her only child and I wanted to go home, so we went home. <laughs> 
But my mom ultimately understands that I'm feeling the cabin fever and feeling it hard, so she agrees. We do what we always do for the fourth, which is make hot chocolate and pop popcorn. Usually we pack blankets to sit on, maybe a chair for my mom, but we already know we're not leaving the car this year. There is no way I'm getting across the old baseball diamond into the fields where we usually watch the fireworks at night on crutches under the influence of a fair amount of painkillers with an isolator brace on my leg. We drive down to the part of town where they set off the fireworks and traffic is bananas and there's nowhere good to park and we end up on the side of the street in one of the older newer suburbs down by my middle school parked next to somebody's driveway. I'm in the back seat sitting sideways because it is the only way I can currently fit my leg into this vehicle. It's summer and it's California so it's hot in the car and one of my legs is entirely covered in black foam and plastic. We are sweaty, drinking hot chocolate out of reused water bottles, and we can only sort of see the fireworks. By definition, it's not great. We're cramped, we're hot. My mother is stressed out about getting me back out of the car and into the house later. I'm in pain and perpetually exhausted and in a Vicodin haze. But God, if I cared about any of that bullshit. All that mattered was I was out of the damn house and I was watching the fireworks with my mom the same way we always did. When it was over, while well, we waited for everyone else in the area to drive away and leave so we didn't have to fight traffic on cramped streets a second time, I was not ready to go home. After all, while my family is in no way patriotic, and I am probably the least patriotic member of my non-patriotic family, I've always kind of loved the 4th of July. Carnival games, junk food, music, fireworks, barbecue, friends, watermelon eating contests, Italian soda and giant baked potatoes. Stuffed animals from the dollar stores spin the wheel game booth. After a lifetime of 4th of July holidays spent like that, sweating in our car, squinting at the festivities from a distance felt underwhelming to say the least. So we went for a drive. We rolled down a few windows and my mom turned the radio up and we got onto the highway and drove out in the general direction of Napa, taking quiet back roads in the dark, winding our way up the hill where the grape, the grape statue pressure is, grape pressure statue is, making our way back into and through American Canyon, into Vallejo. Our final destination was the nearest Wendy's to get a baked potato. It wouldn't be the same, of course, as the giant one sold at the 4th of July festivities and all of American Canyon's other outdoor gatherings like the farmer's market, but it was the principle of the thing. So we buy potatoes and chili and frosties and with the music up and the windows down, we finally make our way home for the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah Bat. Last but not least, we have Christopher Zimmerly Beck. Christopher Zimmerly Beck holds a BA in Arts and the Humanities with an emphasis in literature from Prescott College. He is also a member of the PNCA Creative Writing MFA program's first graduating cohort. Christopher writes about monsters and parties at the end of the world. His work explores intersections of memory, and tr memory trauma, and a world on the precipice of climate and social catastrophe. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Christopher. <laughs> Thanks everyone. An acknowledgement for Marika, my wife, my life. An acknowledgement, I feel selfish. The Gulf of Mexico was on fire yesterday, might still be today, and I'm drunk on champagne, celebrating a master's degree that at best has only prepared me to console and not to solve the world's problems. These are my anti-acknowledgements. <laughs> the last president of Merrillhurst University, Melody Rose, I think that's your name, to Jeff Bezos, to Sally May, you're never getting a dime, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, my seventh grade math teacher who asked me if I was dumb, and my high school guidance counselor who suggested I join the Marines during the Iraq war. You all are the worst, and I got here despite you. Woo! Woo! Suppositions on boyhood. 
Um, Perrin, if you're in Zoom land, this is from a prompt you gave me, so thank you. <laughs> Suppose for just a minute that you were a boy. Suppose you were 13 years old. Suppose it is the height of summer vacation, a summer vacation spent roaming suburban streets with your best friend. The two of you ride your 21 speed bikes on sidewalks and streets and through brown unwatered lawns, you go swimming at the public pool, sneak into movie theaters to watch R-rated matinees, get in fist fights with other boys in the neighborhood and realize perhaps for the first time that the bodies of the girls or maybe the boys you have grown up with are actually quite interesting and worth admiration. Suppose on one particular day in the middle of August, long after lawns have shifted from green to brown, just as the summer heat is reaching its pinnacle before you believe 90 degree days will ever end, you and your best friend are riding bikes towards the outskirts of your neighborhood when you see a kid from your grade riding his bike, a huffy BMX thing, he is alone. Suppose this kid invites you and your best friend over to his house, you aren't really interested until he says the magic words, the words capable of enticing any sweaty and bored 13 year old boy. He says, I have a pool. Suppose you spend the rest of the afternoon at this kid's house swimming in his pool and drinking really cold cans of Coke that his mother told you and your friend to help yourself to when you came over. Suppose you've never been in a house like this. It's in your neighborhood. It's not different because of class. The boy's father works in construction just like yours does. Like at a lot of places in your neighborhood, his house and yours seem to follow the same design, have the same layout, and were most likely bought and built from the same catalog 50 years before either of you were born. Despite the similarity in shape, the place is totally different than your house. The aesthetic feels dated. It makes you think of pictures you've seen of the house your mother grew up in. Suppose the color palette on the inside of the house, which you notice when you go in to grab a soda, is beige and green and sepia. Nothing is old. The microwave and toaster on the counter are the same brand and model as the ones at your house. Suppose that if you were older, you would recognize the musty, uncomfortable smells permeating through the house for what they were. Unwashed clothes, unvacuumed floors, weed, stale cigarette smoke, and spilled beer but you don't recognize these things, not yet. You will learn to notice and know some of these things, but you still are not quite there. Suppose you and your best friend swim at the kid's house all day. Unlike the inside of the house, the backyard is incredible. The pool is large and gorgeous with an actual deep end tiled in blue with lights that shine below the surface so that you can swim even in the dark of night. The patio furniture is comfortable. There is a refrigerator on the porch. You've never seen a fridge in someone's backyard, but a bike lock is wrapped around the handle to keep it closed. You were told by the kid with the pool that inside that fridge is where the parents keep all their beer for when they have parties. Suppose the pool has a diving board and as the day progresses, your cannonballs and belly flops become more and more elaborate. You notice your eyes don't burn like they do at the community pool and are told Sorry, I just lost my place. And are told, and are told that's because fewer people swim here. So it does not need as much chlorine. Suppose when the kid with the pool explains all of this to you, he also says, you can come over anytime you want. Suppose you do not put sunscreen on your body, your body, your best friend's body, and the body of the boy whose house you are a guest at takes on darkening shades of pink as the day goes by. You are unaware of the sun's radiation, burning and tanning your shirtless back and chest. All three of you are firmly in the throes of puberty. A few weeks ago, you noticed a tangle of hair beneath your swim trunks and felt as though it all appeared down there overnight. But you also know that doesn't make any sense. Suppose the boy whose pool you are swimming at has the earliest stages of what will eventually become a mustache. He's also at least a head taller than you and has hair under his arms, which you sneak glances at anytime his arms go above his head. This armpit hair excites and repulses you. You tell yourself, if you get hair there, you will definitely shave it off. You and your best friend still have what your mothers call baby fat clinging to your hips, 
And while your bodies are entering adolescence, you are maybe for the first time in your life or the last time in your life, still a little boy. Suppose at some point as the sun is getting low on the horizon, you realize there are no adults of the house, that the mother who told you and your best friend to help yourselves to cans of cold Coke has left. The kid whose house you're at just says his mother is out and that his dad is gone for the night too. Suppose the kid whose house it is tells you his mother left money for pizza and he asks if you want to spend the night. You think it's weird the mother didn't say goodbye, didn't set any rules or expectations. Suppose you and your best friend have a little conference, acknowledge that neither of your mothers will let you spend the night at a new friend's house without first checking in with an adult at the house. Suppose you and your best friend resort to that most ancient of sitcom tricks. Your best friend calls his mother and tells her he's spending the night at your house. You call your mother and tell her you are spending the night at his house. Suppose for the first time in your life, you feel truly independent. Suppose after pizza and more swimming, you and your best friend and the kid whose house you are staying at start to get bored. Suppose you start talking, bragging, trying to sound grown up. You tell a wildly embellished story about your father letting you drink beer during your 4th of July family camping trip. One night around the campfire, your dad let you drink about half of a beer. But that's not what you say. Suppose you say you got smashed, hammered. You say you had a dozen ice cold beers that night. Neither your best friend nor the kid whose house you were at knows enough about alcohol to call you out for your bullshit. <laughs> Suppose the kid whose house you're at says, yeah, I drink all the time. Suppose your best friend seems a little nervous. Suppose the kid whose house you're at asks if you and your best friend want to get drunk. Suppose you say, yeah. <laughs> but your friend seems nervous and suggests you all just swim more. Suppose the kid at the pool says he knows how to unlock his parents' beer-filled refrigerator. Suppose this is how a half hour later, the three of you find yourselves each holding a tall can of cheap American Pilsner. Suppose it's gotten dark and cold out the way the Pacific Northwest summers used to. So the three of you take your beers from the house's poolside to its basement. The floor is covered in the same shag carpet that's upstairs. There is a couch and an orange recliner. The uncomfortable and unrecognizable smells you noticed earlier are even more intense in the basement than they, were up, than they were upstairs. Suppose this is where they originate from. Suppose this is where you and the other two boys start to really drink. As soon as the beer touches your tongue, you choke from the bitterness. But after a few more sips, you find your stride. The kid whose house you're staying at gives you a hard time when you choke. So you take large gulps from the can to show that you can handle it. Your best friend, the one who was nervous about the whole thing and had tried to talk you out of getting into the beer in the first place, is surprised to discover he doesn't mind the bitterness. He plunges ahead with enthusiasm and gets quite drunk. Suppose by now it is dark outside, your sunburn that you were unaware of earlier stings, but in a way that is only halfway painful. Its bite is almost pleasurable. Suppose the three of you keep drinking beer, you and your best friend finish the first can and open another. The boy whose house it is opens a second one as well. Eventually, the edge of your vision gets fuzzy. Suppose you really enjoy your first experiences of time dilated by booze. Suppose you don't really know when or how it happened, but you are suddenly awake, which means you were definitely asleep. Suppose you see sunlight shining in through the small basement window at the top of the wall and you realize it is tomorrow. Your best friend and the kid whose house you are staying at are still asleep. Suppose when you open your eyes, you notice the beer cans. You and your best friend had decided to crush the cans as you finished them. Next to where you slept are several crushed cans and there are even more next to your still sleeping best friend. But you notice the cans next to the kid whose house it is aren't crushed. They're not knocked over and you begin to reflect on the night, you wonder how much he drank and become certain those cans are actually still quite full. Suppose as you come fully into wakefulness, you realize that you are cold. No, not cold, wet. You look down at your swim trunks and see a stain in their front. You smell urine. 
Confused and embarrassed, you get up from the floor where you slept, uncovered and without a pillow. Damp, you quietly walk upstairs and go out back. You are not as quiet as you would have liked to have been, and you hear either your best friend or the kid whose house you are staying at coming up the stairs behind you. You are unsure of what to do with your urine-soaked trunks and the smell of piss radiating from your body. Suppose you panic for a moment, but you see the pool and decide to run from the back door to the house and jump in. You do this just as the boy whose house you are staying at reaches the top of the stairs. Your best friend comes up the stairs behind him. The boy whose house you are staying at asks what the three of you are going to do today. He says his mom won't be home until later. The way he asks what the three of you are going to do makes you cringe a little bit. You swim to the poolside, you get out. Then you look at your friend and feel guilty. Suppose your best friend says his stomach and head hurt. You say you've got to go home. The kid whose house you're at asks you if you want to come over later. And you say, yeah, maybe, definitely, maybe. I've got to check in with my parents first. Suppose you feel strange, off, conflicted. You tell yourself yesterday was fun. Most of it genuinely was. A day spent in the pool, pizza, soda, no adults telling you what to do. It was great. Even getting drunk was fun, and it's something you think you'd like to do again quite soon and quite often. <laughs> Suppose that you're just unable to put into words what you feel so bad about. But on some level, you're aware that the house with the pool makes you sad. You figure it out. The house, like the boy who lives there, aren't taken care of, aren't respected. It's not the neglect of the house making you sad, making you want to get on your bike and pedal away. It's the neglected boy who lives there that makes you feel panic constrict in your chest. Suppose your best friend has a similar reaction. As you both pedal away, he confides his stomach doesn't really hurt, and he asks if he can come over to your house. You both are quiet the rest of the bike ride, but when you get to your house, you go inside, and your mother is sitting at the dining room table drinking a cup of coffee. She's surprised to see you both so early. She asks if you both would like some breakfast, and you say, sure. Then she asks how your night was. Suppose you say, mom, leave us alone. Let's give another round of applause for all of our readers this evening. So our graduates, um, we are now moving into a pause, into a break, and you will see that there have, um, there should be some food that has materialized. And, um, but our um, Jackson Seemeyer, who is head of the Office of Student of Life, wants to meet with all of our graduates for just a few minutes outside the doors. He is going to direct, give you some direction in preparation for our graduation ceremony. Um, everybody else can just hang out and enjoy, and we will start our ceremony around 6.30. And there is, there is food and drink outside. Meg, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, enjoy. Enjoy. And the graduate.